name is Lincoln Baxter, and this talk is on URL rewriting, what that means for your own productivity, the security of your applications, and uh, the usability, the end user usability of your applications. This is what I look like in the morning. Um, but I'd like to start with a quote. Judgments prevent us from seeing the good that lies beyond appearances. When we think about the web, we very quickly make judgments. We make judgments based on how the website looks, how it feels, if it's performant, and we're very quickly able to determine whether or not a website is going to be giving us a good experience or maybe an experience that we can't trust or an experience that we feel might harm us or just take too much of our time to be worth it. And this is something that we're very good at in all aspects of our life. It's not just the web, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a car, it's you know, the, the type of music that's on the radio station. We're very good at this, and if we're not careful, if we don't take certain things into account, we can immediately turn people off to the website that we are developing. And this starts with the URL, because that's the first thing that people see when they enter your site. They get a link to it somewhere. So, what is URL rewriting? Anyone here know? What do you think? Right, so transforming one URL into another, or I'd like to say any modification of the HTTP request response lifecycle uh, as a more general application of that practice. So we've got problems with the web. Uh, a lot of problems, actually. The first one is missing or relocated resources. There's a lot of stuff out on the web that it's just not there anymore. Uh, there's a problem with readability and clutter. I'll explain that one a little bit later, but this is just presenting people with too much information or the wrong information. There's the formatting of that information. How do we present this to people in a human readable way so that they can comprehend it? The web was really designed, a lot of aspects of the web were designed for machines, but there's a lot of aspects that are really designed for us as well, and we need to make sure that we're presenting the right information to the right being. The other part is more related to security. So revealing sensitive information. What do we reveal to people? What do we reveal to the, to the machines? And the last one is the validation of the input that we get back from those, those sources. So there are actually many more problems in this, but these are just the few that we're going to touch on today. URL rewriting is not a good choice for doing it wrong. If you want to fix a lot of these problems, URL rewriting is a good choice. So this is the first problem, missing or relocated resources. Who saw this coming? <laughs> you know, we've seen a lot of examples of this over time. In particular, Oracle bought Sun, and they decided it would be a great idea to change everything from sun.com to oracle.com, but they didn't actually fix any of the links once they took Sun's website down, and we ended up with this mess, where none of the old Sun documentation worked. That was easily avoidable, but did they do it? No. Here's what I say about that, right? That sucks. And we start seeing this more and more on the web where we have people creating fluffy, cute little 404 pages because inevitably you're gonna end up there sometimes. And Blizzard actually blames you for finding a page that didn't work. People start getting a little crazy. And I have no idea what that is. But <laughs> this is one of my favorites. And this is mine. But eventually we start seeing people actually invest money in these things. And I don't know how much money this costs, but it obviously took some time. They hired a designer to make an animation that's you know, clever. You get there, you're like, oh, cool, this little robot. GitHub does the same thing. You can move the mouse and the cat and the background shift dimensions a little bit. How many people here use GitHub? A lot of you. It's because you all do startups, probably. <laughs> um, and then people like probably go a little bit too far with things. This is one that I found while searching for creative 404 pages. These two guys decided to make a video. And here they're, they're now taking the page down. There it goes. And, yep, 
Yep, he's down. He's down. And then someone took drugs. This unicorn just won't quit. So what does it mean? What do these 404 pages mean? What is this experience? It means that this happens a lot. This is something that everyone, everyone lands on, and it's something that if you don't you know, provide a nice experience for, you're going to turn people off to your website. But it's really just a distraction from failure. This is something that can be avoided. And it's simple, but there are two ways to have this happen. And there are also two pretty simple ways to fix it. The first thing that happens is that the content existed, and now it is not. In other words, the website sucks. Or the content never existed, and you suck. But either way, no one's going to be happy. So what do we do? Easy. We redirect. We set up, in a sense, virtual links from the old resource to the location of the new resource, and we solve the problem. This is so much of a problem, in fact, that Google recommends that you maintain your redirects for 180 days so that brow old browsers and search engines can recache all of the information that was you know, put there by the initial page, all the initial response codes, all the headers that are cached in the DNS uh, proxies all over the web. 180 days is a long time. But 404 page is not a... Uh, not something to trifle with, apparently, as Kenny found out. So we have several options. We can use a tool like Apache Mod Rewrite. How many of you guys have used that? A bunch of you, okay. So the rewrite module of Apache Mod Rewrite, uh, the, the Mod Rewrite module of Apache is what you would use to do this. Or you could use in Java the Tucky URL Rewrite filter, or a new alternative, um, a tool that I created, which is OCP Soft Rewrite which is a more um, Java, like you code your rules in Java, it gives you a more programmatic approach. But let's move on to number two, URL readability. I think that this is the problem with URL readability on the web. And the reason is, to buy that, you have to go to this link. There's only three reasons why I would click this link if someone sent it to me in an email. The first one is, it came from Amazon, and that's a trusted source. But if it were some link that I didn't really know of, some store, some random place, I would probably question whether or not I wanted to open that in my browser. Unless, of course, I use Linux, in which case I'm pretty fearless. I don't care, because I'm not going to get a virus. And the third is, maybe we're friends, and I might trust you. But even so, you get an email from one of your friends, maybe his email account got hacked. Maybe uh, you know, someone else logged in and decided to play a prank on him or something like that. You can you never be sure because this URL is just full of junk. This is what it should be. Amazon.com slash shop slash Kindle Touch. It's immediately clear to me what I'm going to get when I click this. Now, Amazon actually has a couple reasons why they have all that information in there. They have uh, a refer program. So if you actually send someone to Amazon's site, they track, based on the referrer code in the URL, uh, who generated the link and then who should get a percentage of the, the sale of that product. But they have an option. They don't actually need to show you any of this stuff in order to track that information. They can, in fact, make it abundantly clear that you should not care about it while maintaining the cleanliness of the URL. Here we have amazon.com slash shop slash Kindle touch, question mark, query string, all of the rest of the junk encoded into a string that I know is not for me. But I still know what is for me, and that's what's in the path of the URL. This is one strategy. This can also be used to actually secure the information in that URL. The problem with Amazon's website is this link is vulnerable. It has this uh, PFRDT and PFRDP code and PDF, PFRDI. Those three are the referrer codes 
for the person that sent the link. If I really wanted to, I could copy that link or intercept it, insert my own link, insert my own codes as a referrer, and hijack people's uh, referrals to Amazon if I could intercept people's links when they posted them, etc. Um, Amazon could protect themselves if they encrypted this and also present a nicer experience to their users. Which gets me to the next point, which is formatting this information. As I already hinted, there are some things we can do to the URL path itself to make it more consumable for people. This example does not use the path very extensively. We have a top-level domain and then a whole bunch of query parameters that tell our application what to do. This is machine consumable information. There are a couple problems with this. Um, the first one is it's not cool, so be cool and let's rethink this. Example.com slash store slash shoes slash one and maybe we're purchasing that item. The reason the old URL is bad for humans is because query parameters are not necessarily ordered. And being mostly a, a society and a culture that reads from left to right, an unordered query string, let me go back up there for a second, is not necessarily in the order that's going to be easiest for us to consume. It actually takes me time in seconds to figure out what this means. And while it's not necessarily the worst experience in the world, it's still something that's going to make people think, huh, should I really click that? But there's nothing malicious there. It's just a link that's a little bit sloppy. So we come down, we can fix it quite easily. Which brings me to my next question. Why are you afraid of buying a used car? Or what are you afraid of? Subadequate parts? Substituted parts. Substituted parts. Maybe not everything is original. Yep. Yeah. Anything else? Maybe it breaks. Anyone else? You have no idea what happened to it before. What it really comes down to, all of those things, is a lack of trust. You have no idea what you're going to get. And this is the same thing with a URL, really any URL. When you click it, you're, 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 making a, you're, you're taking a certain level of trust in that URL that it's going to give you what you expect. So do you trust me? No? No, not really? Would you click this link at work? <laughs> you could get fired for clicking this link, that's right. So I'm not going to click that, but if we had not used an obfuscated URL, we might have known that it would have been a Rickroll. How many people have been Rickrolled in their life? How many people don't know what a Rickroll is? All right, fine, I'm going to click it. This is a Rickroll. That's Rick Astley performing his lovely dance. And I just lost the game. And this is, you, you send it to someone in the context of a conversation where you're like, hey, I just found a really cool car. And then you send them this link, and there's this. <laughs> Not exactly a great experience. So, oh no, that was too far. There we go. Right, OK, all right, that was the next section. So build trust by reducing the clutter in your URLs and make it more easily apparent what that URL is going to provide. Now, YouTube, again, has a reason why they do the URL encoding that they do. That's because they have so many URLs, so many accesses, that they actually build in a strategy of performance optimization in their URLs so they can serve things faster. But this is a unique constraint to YouTube. I don't think many of us have that much traffic. Um, which gets to my next point, revealing sensitive information. No one likes to admit they use .NET. Not even Microsoft. They actually stripped off the ASPX suffix of this link. Why? Well, we have all of these different frameworks. We have JSF, Struts, PHP, 
Seam, Ruby, Perl CGI, JSF again, another um, indication. We have .NET, we have plain Java JSP, <coughs> and many more. The fact that I could name the technology that these suffixes usually go with is a bad thing because that's the first piece of information that people can start to use to attack our websites. So, the alternative, don't expose that information. By hiding the suffix of the technology, we remove one piece of information that would give people insight into the way we've designed our systems. And insight into the way you've designed your system is the only way to compromise it, pretty much. Unless you use something someone else has done and someone else's insight. A good magician never reveals their implementation. How many people use Apache in some form or another? Most of us, right? So Apache has this lovely little feature where on the 404 page or even in the headers of every page that's served, it tells you the version number and the build number and the date of that build of the particular version of Apache you're using. Does that seem like a good idea? Maybe it's good for popularity, but it's not really good for security. So I actually recommend disabling all of these features whenever you can. And if you can't disable it with uh, Apache, sometimes you can strip these things out in your application. It depends on your environment. So just get rid of it. Don't give people that information. The next part of security is the other way, right? We don't want to provide people with information that they can use to attack us. And we also want to make sure that the information we are giving them access to is actually something that they can then, uh, that, that we can verify and validate. So the URL is user input, right? It's something that comes from the user's computer and comes to our system. The same is true for request headers, um, any request parameters. These are all forms of user input. And while many of us probably do know to validate this stuff already, sometimes we forget about headers. Sometimes we forget about the URL. Uh, it's just it's the, the less common forms of attack, but things that are still possible. Uh, an interesting study released by Aspect Security actually said that two of the three recent uh, vulnerabilities discovered in web frameworks were URL-based. And these were interesting because not only did they give access to information in the system, they gave actual root access. And it was really easy. How many people are familiar with the expression language in Java? You basically, you type in, you, you provide a string and that string gets decoded by the system and then um, that, that string gets evaluated and then executed. And it actually lets you type static Java method calls in there. So if you type system.exec, It'll evaluate it. System.exec gives you access to the root, um, to, to the user's account on the, the, the system that's running it, the Java application. And that was an exploit in Struts. That was an exploit in Spring. And also in Seam. Um, I'm pretty sure that both of these have already been fixed, but still, nonetheless, there are people who probably have not patched their versions of these applications. And this is a URL based attack. We can secure existing applications without modifying the existing code by adding some functionality like this. So when we have an inbound request where the URL, uh, is, where either the URL is not constrained by the selected characters, so there are some characters we don't want to allow, or maybe there's a request parameter that has some of this information that we don't want to allow, or maybe we can add headers there as well, we just want to abort that request or we could take some other action. This is something you can do in any URL rewriting framework. It just takes a little bit of work to set up your constraints and your validations. But it's something you might want to think about doing if you really have a mission critical system because you don't want to leave these things open. This is a real life example. If anyone here can tell me where this link goes, before I go to the next slide, I'll give you $10. What am I going to find on this page? Uh, 
Okay, that's good. It's, a, it's an LL Bean catalog. What, what, what kind of products am I going to find there? That's a good answer. Products in category 28, right? That URL should have been this. And in fact, if you go to this URL, it sends you to the other one. Why? Why, not, why is this not good enough? What, what information in that other thing was not good enough for us? If we take another look at that, we can actually see that it's a web app. Cool. I think I knew that already, right? <laughs> we can see that it was served from an IBM uh, web store. This is what the WCS stands for. Um, we can see that it was hosted from a servlet. Now we know we're running Java. We can see that there's some vectors for attack here, category 28 and store ID 1. Those are places where we can start entering information and trying to break our system. Now, catalog ID 1, OK. I could presume maybe there are options for different types of catalogs out on the web. Like maybe they have a few varieties that they send out and they're tracking who goes to which. But language ID negative 1, I don't know who speaks that. I mean, I don't think computers even speak negative 1. They speak 1 and 0. And then, I don't know what this is. Someone in my, one of my previous talks told me, but I don't remember. It has something to do with the IBM web, um, web store. So if there happens to be a vulnerability in that, congratulations, you just exposed that as well. So clean it up. Don't show this information unless you really have to. And if you do have to, as we'll see in the demos, there are some ways that we can protect ourselves from this kind of attack. But since that was maybe a little bit heavy, I'm going to take a brief interlude and say that the HTTP 1.1 uh, status code 418 has a small message for us. It is a teapot. The resulting entity may be short and stout. This is in the spec. <laughs> All right. <laughs> That's cool. <laughs> I don't, I don't really get it, but that's in the spec. Um, so we've got some problems, right? We have missing or relocated resources. We have a readability problem with people seeing URLs. We have a formatting problem. We want to present information that people will be able to easily consume and not make one of those snap judgments when they come to our when they receive a link to our website or see that link on the page. We don't want to reveal too much information because we could potentially expose ourselves to an attack. And we want to make sure that the information we do expose is validated. So this leads us to our proposed solution, URL rewriting, or modifying the inbound response and outbound, requ uh, inbound request and outbound response. There are a couple types of URL rewriting tools. We have proxy-based tools like Apache Mod Rewrite, one of the limitations of which is it is an inbound-only tool. So when you have a request come in from a client browser into your server, Mod Rewrite gets a one chance to handle that, which is right when it hits, right before it goes to your application. Anything your application sends back is uh, actually, so there are, there are two chances. When your application sends a response back, Apache Re Rewrite can actually add headers to that, but it can't change the content. That's a problem because if you want to apply a rewriting rule to an existing application, you might be able to change links and redirect links that are coming in, but if you're still delivering links that are incorrect going out, you're just perpetuating the problem. Then you have to change code. So it makes sense for us to be able to do that on the outbound as well, and that's where the filter-based tools come in. And as I said, there are a couple options. I'll go over those. But they let us do inbound and outbound rewriting. So we can modify not only the inbound request, but also the outbound response and the content of that response. So there are a couple basic things that we can do with all types of URL rewriting. We can do redirection and relocation. 
This is to address our missing or relocated resources problem. So we have all these requests coming into our system. And if they hit an old URL, we're just going to send them to the new one. The browser will update itself. The bad links will go away. The problem fixes itself over time. It takes a long time, but it works. We can do inbound parameterization. This is an interesting strategy for taking a not necessarily friendly URL and taking the query parameters out of it and embedding them into the path. So here, this would be equivalent to um, accessing a web application with a question mark and then category equals whatever was at the category parameter and then item equals whatever was at the item parameter. Again. So this is how we can take an old query string and turn it into a path. We can do URL validation. We can inspect the values of inbound links. We can restrict what people can access our website with. We can do header validation and modification. And I have no personal investment in any of these tools, but we're about to see some examples. Um, the part that I really like is the filter-based stuff, because we can do a whole lot more. We can do transformation canonicalization. So this is uh, how many, you know, when you, when you type into Google, right, and you type a word wrong, it says, did you mean? You can actually do that for your website. You can add a couple parameters and then introduce a uh, canonicalization system. Oh, yeah, here we go. Where if someone types the case wrong, we can, we can make the case correct. This could be more complicated. This could actually reach out to a system and say, what words look like what we got? <coughs> Excuse me. What words look like what we got? And what words does our site accept that are similar? If there's one that makes sense, send them to it. <coughs> Sorry. Recovering from a cold. Um, The one on top here says, um, maybe we want to introduce compression of certain resources. We have a CSS file, and we don't want to have to compress that when we're developing. We just want these resources to be compressed when we're hosting them at runtime. So we say, if any resource request comes in that matches CSS, run it through a filter that's going to perform compression. That's another kind of transformation we can do. We can do complex conversion and validation. <coughs> Here we have a web store. And that web store takes in a product ID, which we have now restricted to, <coughs> restricted to only the um, numbers, a few word characters, and a few more numbers, whatever the format of our, um, of our parameter is. Then we bind that to an expression language value. We actually can in directly inject that value into our system. And maybe we also want to convert that value into a product itself and then validate the product. We can do all of these kinds of things. We can also perform request interception. This one's a little more complicated. And this one says, when someone accesses your site, maybe they have started to sign up for your services. But you don't want to make them type in a username and a password to get them access. You send them out to Google. You say, hey, Google, can you, <coughs> wow, sorry. Hey, Google, can you authenticate, can you authenticate this person for me? And when you get the result back from Google, you know a couple things about them. You know their name, and you know their email address. But maybe we don't have a password for them yet. Maybe we'd like to, to give them the ability to log in without Google. So what this says is, OK, 
we have a partially authenticated user. They're in the database, but they have not confirmed their username yet. Oh, right, right. Sorry. Uh, we get the, the, their, their actual name from Google and their email address, but we don't have their username, what they want to publicly display to people when they come to your website. So we see that they have an account in the database, but they don't have a username yet. So if that's the case, then we're going to redirect them to the uh, account confirmation page. This is something else that we can do using a more native-based rewriting solution that we would have trouble with doing in a proxy-based solution. <coughs> and in this case, it's actually doing a forward. So they never experience a redirect. They access the page. The URL they access stays the same. They're just pre presented with a, uh, a form that, that lets them type in their username. Any questions about this? Questions so far? And there are there are there are ways to handle image requests separately. Um, I'm personally a fan of the uh, rule that said or the, the the condition that says if this resource could be handled by a servlet, or if this resource could be handled, or if this resource actually exists physically on the disk, then don't apply this rule. So there are strategies, but that's actually a very good concern because you can shoot yourself in the foot pretty easily with stuff like this. There's some things that you shouldn't do with Java URL rewriting. Any ideas? What should you not do in Java? Okay. Data transformations. There's a pretty generally applicable rule I'd like to suggest. And that is, if it needs to run when your app is not running, don't put it in Java, because it's not going to run. That's where you put it in a proxy. So redirects and that kind of stuff, you generally want to put in the proxy layer. So that was maybe uh, a general overview of URL rewriting, but let's see how it actually applies. If you guys want to try out these demos and you have bar sc barcode scanners, I'll try to put the barcode up there for you and you can pull it up on your phone or you can just type in the URL as it appears on the screen. Let me know if you got it. You got three seconds. <laughs> it's access rewriterhcloudcom But I'm going to show you guys locally. So This is an example of using URL rewriting to control access to a website based on certain conditions. So here we are. And I'm going to demonstrate time-based access and also domain-based access. You would probably not usually want to put time-based access into your website in the Java layer. I've done it here because it's more convenient for examples sake. But say you have a maintenance window when you want your website to come down, you want to show people some other content. <coughs> you can introduce a rule which is going to restrict access based on what time it is. So here we see that our timer is ticking down. We currently have access, but in 10 seconds, we are going to be denied access and shown a different resource. There we are. And just to prove to you guys, let me unfull screen here. This URL is going to remain the same for whichever, whichever content is displayed. And the way we've done that, we've simply introduced a rule that says if, uh, whoops, wrong one. 
here we go. Join this URL. And if it's an inbound request and time condition is not granted, then don't actually provide access. This is a little bit more uh, complicated than I would like, but again, I'm doing this in Java. Um, the next example, the domain-based, makes a little bit more sense for certain features. So I've accessed this web application at localhost. However, if I access it at 127.0.0.1, I'm denied access. Maybe you have multiple clients. Maybe you want to dynamically control which client can access your website or which parts of your website based on their permissions. This is a strategy you could use to do that. Uh, it's, again, not really a, a particularly productive example, but it's just an example of using this technology to do that kind of limitation. So here, we join the URL to our resource on the server, and if the domain does not match localhost or the OpenShift cloud, we're going to deny access by returning false. <coughs> Excuse me. Any questions about that? So the next demo is the validation and conversion demo. And this one says uh, we're going to implement some REST web services, but we're actually going to implement them only using URL rewriting tools. More of a fun example, but it also demonstrates how we can validate and convert the information we receive. So here's our demo. Sorry, it's boring, but again, it was created without actually any HTML pages. It's all being generated by our rewriting configuration. We can come in here. We can see the first product. We can see the second product, third product. We can see all products. And we can actually add products. I'm going to view source here. Take one of these. Open up the REST client, paste in our content. I'm going to, is it post that creates? And I'm going to post that to this URL. And if I did that right, we get an OK response. And now we should see two tickets for the football team, but because that was already in there, let's make it a little different. What should we add? Oh yeah, getting rid of the idea would be good. That actually doesn't matter in the system, but good point. Um, let's add something that has nothing to do with anything here. Um, what kind of car do you have? Do you, what kind of bicycle? Okay, no method of transportation. He is static. Feet, right? And the price for feet is priceless. So we're going to send that. Now we should, when we go back to our products list, see no method of transportation right here. So let's take a look at the interesting stuff, the configuration. Here we have a rule that says if the method is get and the URL has a product ID, where that product ID is a digit and also an integer, this is important for a reason I'll show you soon, we're going to convert that into a product and then validate the product. Um, then we get the product, the converted value out of the context. Here you could actually just you know, do your database load or whatever and then stream that back to XML to the client. But what happens if I get rid of this integer constraint? I'm going to save. 
I come back to my product list, my single product, and then I'm going to start trying to attack the website, actually. How many nines do I need? All right, 404. That's not what I wanted to show you. Let's reload this. There we go. So we actually had a number format exception because we overflowed the integer. A very simple example of why you should validate simple information. So let me come back and add in our integer constraint, which simply verifies that we can actually, in fact, convert what we got into an integer. We'll see that this works. And now we just get a 404. The rest of this is pretty straightforward. Again, we're handling the products, and we're streaming all of them. Then here's how we uh, handle the post request, where we reverse stream. We actually take the XML and then marshal it into a product, then store it maybe into our database or whatever. Not really practical because there are lots of ways to do REST that are already out there, but just an example of the importance of why you should validate and convert. So the next demo <coughs> excuse me, is one of my favorites. This gets back to the whole topic of exposing sensitive information in your query string and also how we can protect ourselves from attacks in the query string, protect ourselves from manipulation and hijacking of query string information, <coughs> and also make it abundantly clear that the information we have in the query string is not meant for a human. It is, in fact, meant for a computer. So here we have a straightforward page, and whatever I type into the address as a query string is going to be encoded and encrypted so that we cannot modify it and that data is hidden. What should I type? Anything equals what? Global. Um, give me something to type. SSN, okay. <laughs> what should I type? Random things. Okay. So here we can see we've been redirected to an address with this long, nasty thing that I have no idea what it means, but the application still knows that anything is global, a random is a thing, and an SSN is one through zero. And this is, again, the um, value of our other uh, encrypted parameter. So if we look at the page here, <coughs> oops. Let's see, we're just um, I'm sorry, that's not the right one. We're just actually printing out that information directly from the request. So our rewriting tool has modified, <coughs> modified the request to now include more information than we were, um, or include the decrypted information as if it had already been in the original request itself. So here we just get the request and then print out all the parameters on the page. So the interesting thing about this is 
not only we have, have we obfuscated it, we've also encrypted it. And if we try to modify it by adding some stuff in here, we have more information. We now have the ability to detect when people are messing with us. And we can take some action. Excuse me. Um, how, what happens if you append additional parameters? Yeah, I mean, the team starts to add <coughs> uh, So I want another parameter. I'm guessing that it's going to actually append this information and into the encrypted string. More info. Yeah, so we got, uh, we already have an encrypted parameter, so it just didn't do anything with it. Well, yeah, so you say where info is? Yep. Oh, yeah, okay. It'll probably give us a hello. Oh, no, it didn't. Yeah, but I'm using Java server faces to print it out, so that's protecting us inherently. Mm -hmm. But the idea is there. Right, so we can do this kind of thing by saying we want to encode all query parameters into another parameter, and then if there is a checksum failure, we can take some action. This is something you can implement with or without this kind of a tool, but it's a strategy you, you could consider if you want to maybe send secure URLs to people. It's just uh, an extra level of protection. So let's get back to the good stuff. Well done. So, everything is going to client side, right? And I don't really care about requests and responses anymore because now we get a WebSocket connection. It doesn't matter, right? I'm connected. I can send whatever data I want back and forth across SSL, right? Well, this is how lots of applications work as client apps in the browser. This is Twitter. We can see at the top here, this is the URL that I've used to access Twitter. <coughs> and Twitter says, OK, I'm going to serve up the application and then inspect the anchor tag. And I know that I'm accessing either Lincoln 3, my account, or I'm accessing slash connect or slash discover to do a search. And I'm going to use that information to show what's relevant based on the URL that I was given. But it's messy. And with HTML5, we have a better choice. <clears throat> with HTML5, we have the push state method, which lets us actually take the URL and change it in the browser without redirecting or without actually sending a new request back to the server. This is interesting because now we can load a client-side application that client-side application can perform navigations without actually refreshing the browser while still preserving the ability to bookmark your state, bookmark where, what you're looking at in that client-side application. This is huge. But there's kind of a problem because, well, first, now you have to serve that application from every possible bookmarkable URL you've got. That's pretty simple, right? You just take all of them, and no matter what you request, you always serve up the application. That's simple, right? So no matter what we get, we're going to serve it up. But then we see something like this. We have our example web page, and then the example web page with the username Lincoln, and that user has a project called Project 1. Then Lincoln decides to create a project called Lincoln. Now we start to have a problem. What is the root of this URL? Was it served from Lincoln, or was it served from Lincoln Lincoln? Are we looking at a user's account, or are we looking at the user's project? It's more difficult for the application to tell. We could hard code this into our domain, but if it's a product we're delivering to people, we don't know what the domain's going to be. So we need to deliver that information somehow to the client. And this is something that URL rewriting can help us with. We serve up the application, no matter what the requested URL was. And with the response, we send a cookie. That cookie contains the root of the application. 
HTML5 actually introduced a new uh, element called the base tag, I believe, which lets you serve that information up in the HTML content. That's another way to do it. But if you're not doing either of those things, then you could also um, maybe have your client application send another request back to the server and then receive the information it needs before it loads once it's established the socket connection. Um, that's just one of the strategies you can use. And it's just one of the little problems that comes up every day. One of the things that we have to deal with that URL rewriting can address. And we are always finding more applications of URL rewriting. So I'd like to posit that URL rewriting is not a good choice for doing it wrong. If you want to fix problems, this should be one of the places you look first. So is that the end? Absolutely not. I'm hoping that this is the beginning of your adventure with URL rewriting. And if you'd like more information, please stay in the loop. You can visit the Rewrite Project website. That's the project where you saw code examples from today at ocpsoft.org slash rewrite. You can follow OCPsoft on Twitter. And you can definitely get involved because this is all open source. And we, uh, we would love to have your input. So thank you very much. Any questions? <laughs> questions? So the question is, what, in what scope are the rules being defined? Um, in, in this case, you can actually define them in whatever scope you want. Because uh, are, are you asking like in the, the bean management scope or just general scope? So, so the, the, the potential issue I see here is complexity, right? There's a lot mm -hmm. of complexity in ensuring how you get things correct and how you can open up more holes. Right. Uh, yeah, because there's, there's a, a large rule set associated with these. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, I'm just curious to see where that fits in if you're kind of applying some global filtering on, the, on all inbound requests to maybe at some level uh, mm -hmm. you know, detail transformations at, say, the, if you have a, you know, a REST API, you can just annotate right. fairly cleanly. So the rules that we saw here are generated on every request. Mm -hmm. And this works because we're doing it all in Java. We're not parsing a configuration file. We're not doing anything like that. So it's very fast. And if you want more speed, you can actually cache the rule set based on whatever conditions you need. But uh, because this happens on every request, you can inspect the state of every request as it comes in and determine whether or not you want to apply certain portions of that. So you can enable or disable certain parts of the configuration based on the state of the system. Uh, by default, it's uh, request scoped. If you would, but you could. Kind of doing that as a JSF beam off the request scope, I think, right? So why, why, because it's not like the server context being passed into it. Why was that just not a standard server filter? So it is actually a server filter. Um, there was nothing JSF specific in this other than the fact that the demos used JSF to do the pages. In one of the constructions, you were taking a server context object, and I was just confused about why pass over that object versus like a request response object. So uh, I can explain that. The reason the servlet um, context is being passed into the rule set is because sometimes you need to do things like get the context path. Okay. Yeah. And um, in order to verify that you're not doing some bad things in the configuration, because like you said, you can actually shoot yourself in the foot pretty easily. The configuration is built once when the filter starts up to make sure that you're not doing anything on a per request basis um, other than inspecting or using deferred inspection of values. So if you try to reference an object that's not available until a request is active, that is not allowed because um, you can have a reference to an object and then access it once it's available. But if you do configuration on a per request basis in a global configuration, you can actually introduce um, request. Uh, you can bleed information between requests if you're not careful. And so that's why that's not allowed. But what you can do is come down here, and we're going to say define rule when new 
HTTP condition. And now we have a servlet rewrite event and a rule evaluation context. This rewrite event has the request and the response in it. And that's where we get the ability to access the per request information. But we're doing this within the confines of an object that is only being accessed on that request and does not modify, in theory, the other information. Other questions? Yeah, so there are some pre-built rules, uh, such as join. And join is pretty much the simplification of, I want this URL to go to this resource. Um, but if you want to do something complicated and build up your own more complex rule, you can use define rule, and then you can create your own conditions. You can also create your own operations. In the perform clause, which is much very similar to the condition, it's just the action that you're defining. And you can chain these things with and and you know build as, as much logical uh, decision tree as you want. Cool. Thanks guys.